My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Hi, I'm Jim Kelly. Today's leadership quote comes from Andy Stanley, who says, the value of a life is measured by how much of it was given away. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become confident, game-changing leader assistants. It's episode 40. We made it to episode 40. I'm so excited. It's been a wild and busy ride, but a fun one. Check out the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash 40. And be sure to join our thriving Slack community at slack.leaderassistant.com. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Leader Assistant Podcast. It's your host, Jeremy Burrows. And today I'm super excited to talk with Jim Kelly. Jim is the executive assistant to Michael Hyatt. Jim, how are we doing? I'm doing great, Jeremy. Thanks for having me on today. I appreciate it. And what part of the world are you in? So we're in Nashville, Tennessee. So I uh, we moved here about three years ago, my wife and I. Um, so yeah, we're enjoying enjoying the South. I'm originally from New York, so the South is a bit different than uh, than New York. Nice, nice. So what was your very first job, and what skills did you learn in that role that you still use today? Mm-hmm. So my first job, my first real job out of college, I, I had a few small jobs in high school and working through college. Of, I worked at a pharmacy and worked at a golf course, but my first legit job after college was working for an insurance company, and I worked as a junior sales assistant. And that pretty much meant scheduling meetings for the senior sales assistants, uh, creating reports for them that they needed. Um, I was pretty much their right hand guy for for anything that they needed, which is kind of what I do now as an executive assistant. So a lot of the skills that I learned in my first job, even though I didn't really ever aspire to be an executive assistant, I learned in that first job right after college. Hmm. So how did you end up becoming an assistant and and kind of why did you end up doing it? Yeah, yeah so. I, I became an assistant from, uh, it's a funny story, I started following Michael Hyatt, um, who's my, my boss now, I'm his executive assistant, so I started following Michael's podcast and his blog about four years ago. Uh, my wife and I were training for a marathon at the time, and I needed a bunch of podcasts to listen to while I was training for this, this marathon, and Michael's podcast came up in my feed, and I said, oh, let me check this guy out. And I started listening to his stuff, and I said, "Wow, this this guy is really inspiring, and his leadership sounds a lot a lot like the the leader that I eventually want to work for." Um, so I started following him. I started researching his company, and I actually applied for a job within the company. Um, at the time, it was called Intentional Leadership, and I applied for a job within the customer service fields because. I really just wanted to jump on board the intentional leadership, Michael Hyatt and company brand, because it sounded so great. Um, So whatever position was available, I wanted to jump on board. So I applied to this customer service job. I got pretty far in the process, but didn't end up getting it. So I was pretty bummed about that, but I I made some connections throughout the interview process. And they said, hey, if we have another position available within the next few months, we'd love to interview you again. So about six months later, I set the date on my calendar. I said, I want to I wanna reach out to these people six months from now and show that I'm still interested in a position within their company. And it turned out that position that became available was Michael's executive assistant. It was Michael and Megan, our COO, executive assistant. And I applied to the job, and the skill set of an executive assistant really matched with my strengths. Um, so I... Like I said, I never aspired to be an executive assistant, um, but the skills that are required for the position really fit well with me. So that's that's kind of the convoluted story of how I got to where I am today. Wow. So what's what are a couple of those skills? Yeah, so I feel like 
being very organized um, is, is a huge skill. Uh, the ability to follow through on tasks. Uh, we have an assessment that we use a lot called the Colby. Are you familiar with it, Jeremy? Yeah, I haven't done a lot yeah. with it, but I'm familiar with it. Yeah, so we use it for our hiring process. And one of there's four basic categories that they're testing for. And one of those categories is the ability of follow through. And it's just following through on tasks. Um, so I feel like I'm really high on follow through and I test really high on that particular assessment on follow through. So Michael is very good with, and a lot of CEOs are kind of similar in this way with giving me a task or having a vision for a task, but maybe not following it through to the end, but they're kind of on to the next thing already. Whereas I am really high on follow through. So I see a task through to the end. So that's that's one one vital component I think of being a great executive assistant, um, and then the other thing, just another component of being a rock star EA, is is being servant hearted, and I feel like my my heart is to serve um, and to make other people around me better, especially Michael in this case. Hmm. So, when you're being interviewed for specifically for that role, what's mm-hmm. something that Michael was looking for in an assistant that he saw in you other than what you've already talked about? Yeah. So I think, so, so I talked about my first job out of college, um, which was in, in insurance. My second job was with a university that actually the university that I went to was my alma mater. And I was an admissions counselor for that, for that, um, for that university. And one of my roles as an admissions counselor was to book my own travel as well as handle my own calendar. Um, When I was speaking, I would be speaking to usually three or four different high schools a day. I would be traveling to the Northeast um, part of the United States. So I would would need to know how long it took from one school to another. So it's pretty intense calendar management. And that's one of the things that Michael was looking for, someone that could handle his calendar. So there's no double bookings. He has enough time in between meetings. And I think that's what set me apart in the interview process was that I was really good at calendar management and that position as an admissions counselor helped set me up for, for this position that I have now as Michael's EA. So what's maybe one or two tips that you could share with assistants listening on, on calendar management? I would say I love Greg McEwen's essentialism book. Mm-hmm. Um, if your leaders haven't read it, um, I would, or if your listeners haven't read it, I would strongly encourage them to read it. Greg McEwen, Essentialism. And one of the things that he says in that book is uh, pretty much multiply everything. If you estimate a thing, a task to take one hour, multiply that by 1.5. So just everything add another half. So if it takes an, if you think it's going to take an hour, Multiply that by 1.5, so say it takes 1.5 hours, just to give your yourself a little bit of buffer, because as you know, Jeremy, probably everything that we think we could do in the allotted amount of time, you know, we're like, oh man, I could have used another 15 minutes, or I could have used another 20 minutes. So give yourself that margin in your, in your leader's calendar, um, because if you book everything up too close together, it just leads to stress, anxiety, and usually you have to end up rescheduling or rebooking and that's frustrating for you as the ea it's frustrating for your leader because then they have to move things around in their calendar or you have to move that for them as well as the other people that you're reaching out to that you're needing to reschedule with Uh, you're just not giving them a wow experience if you're always rescheduling stuff so that's one of the things that's the biggest thing if you could allow yourself more margin in your calendar it's going to be huge. Awesome. So I, I talk about the ideal week calendar a lot. And when one of the first people that I heard talk about it was Michael Hyatt back in the day. Yeah. Um, maybe do you have any tips or thoughts on just the ideal week concept Mm -hmm. and how you all utilize that? Yeah. So we, we love the ideal week. Um, the, the way that Michael structures his week, uh, he usually has all of his internal meetings 
on Monday. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the ideal week as a, as a concept, and then I'll go into Michael's uh, specific, how he, he structures his week. But the ideal week is to lay out your week as if everything to be, everything would work out perfectly. You know, when would you have your, um, your workout time? When would you have your family time? When would you be doing your most important tasks? When would be, you be doing your meetings throughout the day? When would you have lunch? And it's just laying out the framework of what an ideal week would look like. So we do that and we practice that at Michael Hyatt and Company. For Michael specifically, his Saturday and Sundays are his offstage day or his days that he's off. He's not thinking about work. He's not doing any work. Uh, that's Saturday and Sunday. And then Monday through Friday, he's working. Mondays are designated internal meeting days. So he has meetings with me. He has meetings with all his direct reports. He has his executive team meeting. So whenever a, a, a request comes in from our team that says, hey, I'd like to have a meeting with Michael, I know that that could be fit in on a Monday. His Fridays are for external meetings. So if a request comes in from someone that's outside of Michael Hyatt and company, I usually try and fit that in on Fridays. So then Tuesday through Thursday, he's focused on his most important work. And for Michael, that's creating content, delivering content, and then creating the vision for the company. So those are his three most important tasks. So that's really what I try to focus him on, on the most, those three tasks. Because if he is doing other things besides those three things of creating content, delivering content, and the vision for the company, it's not the best use of his time. So we try to structure his week that way. It's hmm. awesome. So how about email? How do you manage Michael's email? I'm assuming he gets a lot of email. Yeah. Um, and what's maybe your number one tip for managing an executive's inbox? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's not getting as many emails, thankfully, as he used to. Uh, I believe when he was the CEO of Thomas Nelson, he was getting probably close to 200 a day. Um, but there are some great tools that we've utilized um, to kind of get that number down, as well as some systems that we've uh, implemented. So two, two hacks or two tools that we really utilize is SaneBox and then Unroll.me. So SaneBox and Unroll.me. Those two, they're filter systems uh, that you can create within your email and they filter certain emails. So if you have, um, for me, for example, I have Best Buy emails or Marriott Rewards emails or um, some, an email that I'm from like a, um, an influencer that I'm subscribed to, uh, I could put those all in unroll.me and then I set a frequency of when I receive this lump sum email with all of those different emails. So I'm not getting pinged throughout the day, becoming distracted by all these different emails. I'm, I'm getting this one lump sum email one time a day. Mm -hmm. And you can set your frequency depending on when you want to receive it. Um, so that's really helped cut down his emails. Uh, and SaneBox is kind of similar to that. You set up filters and then the emails get filtered through a certain email folder. And then we also have utilized Spark, um, and Spark has been really great, and it's an email system. Um, it's an email software that we've utilized, and the best feature that I've found with Spark is that you could comment within emails. So instead of me messaging Michael back and forth, um, forwarding the email to Michael, then him replying to me, then me replying to the person that initially sent the email, I could tag Michael as a comment within this within the email through Spark's system. Michael gets a ping from me. So say, so say Michael gets a podcast request, and then I could tag Michael and say, "Hey, Michael, we got this podcast request. I think it's a really cool opportunity, but I don't think it's going to work for your calendar. It's just too busy right now. What do you think about declining this?" And he could comment within that thread of comments, say, I agree, Jim, can you please decline this invitation? 
So then I could go back to the person and reply as myself and say, hey, thank you so much for this opportunity. Unfortunately, it doesn't work well for us at this time. So we don't have to go back and forth with unnecessary emails, but we could all just do it within the thread of the comments within at, at, while at the same time still seeing that email. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you used Spark at all? You know, I haven't used it, but I, I did do a little bit of research on it a year or so ago and thought it was pretty interesting, interesting concept. So yeah, definitely have to check it out again. Cool. So um, how do executive assistants contribute to an executive's ability to lead, engage, and inspire others? Mm-hmm. So I would say, we, we talked about this at Michael Hyde and Company, um, this idea of the freedom compass. And if you think about a two-by-two two matrix, on one side you have passionate and not passionate, and then proficient and not proficient. So if you could think and envision in your mind a two-by-two two matrix, if you Google the freedom compass, it will come up as well. But so your zones, there's four zones within that matrix. And the, the ones that we tend to focus on are desire zone. So that's passionate and proficient. And then your drudgery zone. So you're neither passionate nor proficient. And I think the biggest role that an EA has is helping your leader be in their desire zone almost all the time. So for Michael, as I said before, those three things are delivering content, creating content, and vision for the company, leading our company. So my role as an executive assistant is to get as much off of Michael's plate as possible that is not within that desire zone. And that usually includes calendar management, expense reporting, dealing with travel, booking travel, all of that. If there's anything that I could take off of his plate so he could focus on what only he could focus on, I think I'm making the highest contribution to our company as well as to Michael. That's awesome. I'll definitely share a link to the Freedom Compass in the show notes so people can check that out. Um, What's one tip that you might share to the executives uh, on how to help them get more out of their assistant and really empower their assistant? Mm -hmm. I would say the biggest thing is to, uh, if you go link to this as well, um, I don't have, uh, you could Google five, five levels of delegation, Michael Hyatt, five levels of delegation. We have a blog post article about it as well. But I think the five levels of delegation are huge um, to help leaders as well as executive assistants get crystal clear on what type of project this is. Um, So for example, level one delegation is, hey, I need this project to be done. I want you to research it, report back to me, and I'm gonna make a decision on it. So that's level one. And then gradually it goes up to, all right, I want you to research it, come back to me with a recommendation, and then I'll make a final decision. And then it keeps leveling up all the way, eventually you get to level five, whereas, hey, I want you to run with this project. I have this vision in mind, but go with it. You don't need to report back to me, I trust you. So those five levels of delegation are so helpful for leaders as well as executive assistants. The leaders, on one hand, helps them maintain a bit of control that you're not just saying, okay, you have to run with this. Um, I have to delegate this to you. It it gives them some baby steps along the way. And then for the executive assistant, it's helpful because it gives them clear direction on, okay, you want me to research this and report back to you and I'm not going to make a decision on this. So it's just great communication between leader and executive assistant. Um, So the five levels of delegation, Michael Hyatt, Google that or check the show notes. I think that's the biggest tip that I could give for leaders and EAs together. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really helpful. Very, uh, very practical. And then even just, I'm sure, printing out those five levels and putting them on your desk or something to just kind of ingrain that in your system would be helpful. Yeah, it it is helpful. There there have been times when Michael has, uh, and I don't have them all memorized to a T. I I know them. 
vaguely like i know okay level one is this level five is that level okay what's level two again mm-hmm. i actually have it saved on my my screen so i could refer back to it so when michael does delegate something to me i could look back and say oh, okay i i know exactly what michael is looking for in a level two delegation nice So what's it like working for a leader like Michael Hyatt, who literally wrote a book on how to effectively utilize an executive assistant? Yeah, no, it's a little bit intimidating. You know, when I first started with with the company, um, I mean, I looked up to this guy. Uh, He's an amazing leader. I I only saw what I uh, listened to and saw on the podcast and from what I read about him. But man, Michael is the real deal. He, he really matches his walk and his talk. Uh, it is, it's awesome to see, it's inspiring to see a leader like Michael. And we often talk about winning at work and succeeding at life. And Michael really does that so well. He has a great family life with his wife, um, Gail, and his five daughters and nine grandchildren. He just has a great family. And then he does an amazing job uh, at leading our company. He's the best boss I've, I've ever worked for. So coming into that, it, it's just, I mean, I'm so humbled and grateful to be working with him. But it's its also a benefit because, yeah, like you said, he wrote the book on h- how to work with an EA. So he has all these tips and tricks that I came into the organization and he, he was teaching me as well as my counterpart, Susie Barber, who's now our uh, senior director of operations. She was kind of my boss initially. I, I, I served Michael, but Susie was kind of my supervisor. And through Susie and Michael, it's just been amazing. I feel like I've had a graduate school level education on business leadership, as well as being a great EA, thanks to those two particular. Hmm. So, on the on the flip side, have you experienced any sort of um, interactions where people are maybe using you to try to get to Michael, um, kind of fairly well known uh, in certain circles? So, you know, I, I've talked about this in some of my podcast episodes where, you know, you work for somebody that maybe even if it's a small town and you're working for an executive that's well known in that small town all the way to working for a celebrity, um, Mm -hmm. assistants often experience kind of a a variety of dehumanizing interactions. Um, You know, for example, maybe people befriend you because they want to get closer to your executive or they ask ask how your boss is doing and not how you're doing. And um, have you experienced anything like that? And, And how have you kind of handled that? I don't think I have, but maybe I'm just so naive or <laughs> so ignorant of the fact that, yeah, someone's trying to get close to me and uh, or trying to get close to Michael through me. So I, I haven't experienced that that I know of, but I have been somewhat guarded. There have been times in the back of my mind where I've thought, is this is this person being legitimate if, or, or are they trying to get closer to Michael through me? Um, and Susie, Susie, who I mentioned before, who was my um, boss when I first entered the company, um, she's been really great at that. Um, there, there was one in particular time where I, I'm thinking that maybe the person was trying to get closer to Michael through me. And I, I mentioned this to Susie and she just gave me the advice, you know, you're an adult, like you can make your own decisions but just be on your guard. You know, there are certain people out there that are trying to get closer to Michael and they will go through you to get to him. Um, so I've been pretty guarded through it, um, but I don't think I've I've gotten there yet. Yeah. Um, but like I said, I could be totally naive and there could be four, four or five people that I have connections with right now that are like, no, I'm trying to get closer to Michael. Right. <laughs> So what about maybe your biggest mistake that you've made as an assistant and what did you learn from that? So so the biggest mistake that I made was we were on a webinar or we had a recorded webinar set to go out to our tribe. So if you're not familiar with Michael Hyde and Company, uh, we're a leadership development company that puts on webinars and live events to help leaders grow 
uh, their business, as well as to help them succeed and live a great life at home. So we had a webinar scheduled. It was set to be a recorded webinar. Michael wasn't going to be on it, and we had advertised it like that. Um, but Michael was going to be on the recorded edition of the webinar, um, his face and everything, because we had it recorded, obviously. So we had that scheduled. And then I also had a meeting scheduled for Michael with one of the boards that he is a part of, one of the committees that he's a part of. And I just wasn't thinking. And I scheduled these two at the same time. And with the Zoom's system, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, what happened was Michael logged in to the committee meeting and it said, there's another meeting going on at this time with this login address. And Michael was confused. He asked me and I said, I don't know anything about another meeting going on. You don't have anything else scheduled. So he ended up canceling the, the meeting that was already going on. Turns out that was the webinar. We had about, I think, probably close to 500 people on this webinar got kicked out all at once. And then someone, we utilize Slack as our internal communication. People in, in our team are saying, oh my gosh, the webinar just shut down. Does anyone know what happened? And it turns out <laughs> we did it. Um, I did it because I double booked us. Um, I just wasn't thinking that the two systems, the two meetings would conflict with each other, that one would totally have to not happen to for the other one to work. So that was super embarrassing. I felt awful. Uh, we worked it out. We, we actually canceled the committee meeting, rescheduled it, and then we were able to jump back in on the webinar and have the recording still going. Mm -hmm. But man, that was super embarrassing. So many people that it impacted. And it just, for me, I take everything um, you know, I, I have a high level of accountability and responsibility, and I, I want to do a good job. So when something like that happens, I just felt like I totally dropped the ball, and I let down Michael and our team. So for, from from there on, we, we changed some systems with our Zoom account. So there was only like a webinar um, Zoom account, and then there was a Michael Zoom account, and the two wouldn't conflict. But, uh, but yeah, Michael was super graceful. He, he, he didn't jump on me or anything like that. He was super understanding, but I was probably harsher on myself than I probably should have been. <laughs> yeah, I've had, uh, I've had similar things happen with Zoom before. And it's just like you forget that, oh, yeah, the, you can't have two Zoom meetings at once on the same account. Yeah. And yeah I've, I've had a oh shoot moments where i'm like oh i gotta go change the zoom on this one yeah otherwise yeah, yeah. so anyways yeah. well how about your uh how about the other side where you've saved the day or any crazy you know last second saving the saving yeah. the moment um stories yeah the I, I would say the one that michael talks about and 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 I enjoy talking about the most is, um, and some people might not do this as an executive assistant, but we don't really um, separate work and and personal life in terms of what an EA does. So I do a lot of Michael's personal stuff as well. And one of those things that I do is book his date nights with his spouse, Gail. And one year, it was two years ago, it was her birthday. And... I just went all out. I planned this elaborate birthday um, extravaganza for, for Gail. Uh, and I made Michael the hero kind of of the story. So I planned this great dinner for them. I, I sent Gail flowers, her favorite flowers. I got Michael a card from uh, Publix. I, I brought it to him and I said, hey, Michael, here's a card that I think that Gail might like. Uh, write a nice message in it. So I gave him a card. Uh, we got her a gift. Um, we got her, Michael bought her a new computer, so he was involved in that part. Uh, got, him, got her a new MacBook Pro. And then for like kind of the, the top off of all of that was I created these date night questions for Gail and Michael to discuss at their date night or their, their birthday dinner for Gail. Mm -hmm. And they were just really deep questions reflecting on the past year, 
from what they said, they both cried, reflecting on how great of a year it had been and uh, some of the things that they had gone through throughout the year. Um, and Michael messaged me the next day on Slack, and he was just wowed by the whole day because Gail was wowed. And he said, Jim, you made me the hero of the day. Like, thank you so much. You went above and beyond um, just for Gail and for myself. So that that was something that I, I'll always remember as, as just a, a highlight for me that I, I was really able to make Gail's day as well as make Michael the hero of, of the story for the day. That's awesome, man. Yeah, it was fun. So let's talk for a second about personal, you know, tasks. And it's fun. It's funny. I do. I do. I've always done both professional and personal. Um, so I've been an executive assistant for 12 and a half years or so. And I've, the whole time I've had personal responsibilities as well. Yeah. And so, uh, but there are a lot of assistants I found, um, that are pretty, have pretty strong opinions on, um, you know, keeping personal separate and like, that's not my job. And so I'm assuming that when you interviewed for the job, the expectations were lined out and clear that you would be doing personal tasks, right? Correct. Yeah. It was lined out in the job description and I was totally fine with that. Um, because at the same time, the job description said, like you're going to be working close to 40 hours a week. Um, so even though I, I'm dealing with Michael's personal tasks, it's not adding more hours to my, my workload. Um, so I was good with that. Yeah. And I totally, I totally get it. And you, you could probably agree, uh, Jeremy, that, you know, you're, you're connected, you're a whole person. So when I struggle at work, um, it probably impacts my home life with my, my wife and my boy. Whereas if I'm struggling at, at home, um, sometimes it impacts work, you know, so, so they're interrelated. So it's tough to distinguish the two and really separate the two completely. But I feel like it's, it's more of a new school method. Um, I know that my dad has an assistant and they don't, they don't combine work and personal. They keep them pretty separate, um, which I feel is kind of a challenge almost because they're interrelated so much. And I feel like I could serve Michael so much better when I know that I'm serving Gail and his daughters as well as him. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I just, it's, you know, you have one life. I even have one calendar. Like a lot of people, even if they do personal assistant stuff, they'll yeah. have two calendars, you know, a personal calendar, or a kid's calendar, and then a work calendar. And I'm just like, no, you just need one calendar because you have one life. <laughs> yeah, no, I do the same thing. It's, it gets, if you have more than one calendar, it sometimes gets a little tough managing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, to be like, which calendar was that? Which calendar does this fall under? So I just feel like if you have one calendar, um, it just makes it a bit easier. Now, I, I will say that we have changed Michael's um, calendar system a little bit since I started. And it's, it's kind of been a game changer, and I've really enjoyed it. Um, but it's not it's not mixing or it's not uh, separating work and personal it's it's separating his meetings and his like front stage time so his times that like he has to be on or he has a place that he needs to be at um we have one calendar for that and then we have another calendar for what we call uh michael hyatt tasks so what i'll do is if there's like a meeting that michael needs to go to I'll put that on his primary calendar. If there's a task that he needs to do, I'll put that on his task calendar. Mm-hmm. And the task calendar is a little bit more flexible and it, it's it's less overwhelming for Michael. What was happening was I was putting in everything on one calendar and Michael was like, oh my gosh, I am completely booked. I have all these meetings. I have to be at these things throughout the entire day. And I was like, no, Michael, you don't. Like, you actually only have, like, two meetings today. Everything else is tasks that I put in that I want you to do during this time block. Um, But we're flexible with that. So that's been really great um, because Michael can now see, like, oh, like, Jim has these three hours set aside for me to prepare. 
but it's a little bit more flexible. So that's that's one caveat that we've been using with calendar management recently with with me and Michael. That's that's been really helpful. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So what makes an assistant a leader? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I say uh, if you if you do John Maxwell's definition of of leadership, leadership is influence, and I feel like you just have tremendous influence as an EA. Um, I just when I got my position with with Michael, um, the goal initially was I wanted him to become a better man, a better husband, better father, better leader. And by doing that, I'm influencing him. And by doing the things that I'm able to do for him, I'm able to influence him and lead him, which trickles down to his family and the team members at Michael Hyde and company. So it's just an amazing responsibility that we have as executive assistants to just influence our, our leader, who is then able to influence other people in their lives, as well as our team as a whole. So it's a it's a great responsibility to have, um, and yeah, it's a it's kind of like a stewardship, you know. It's a, a lot of responsibility, and we're we're there to manage it. That's great, man. Well, I appreciate your uh, your influence uh, in Michael's life, and then the extension of that with Michael's influence um, to many leaders and executives, but also to trickle down to the assistants because he's always been a firm um, believer and, you know, advocate for assistants and empowering your assistant and really utilizing an assistant if you really want to lead well. So appreciate the work you're doing. And thanks so much for taking time out of your day to be on the show and share your tips with my listeners. And how can we find you online and support what you're up to? Yeah, so th- th- thank you so much, Jeremy, for having me on the podcast. I appreciate it. Um, probably the best way to find me and find the work that we're doing is just michaelhyatt.com, and uh, and you can find out all the information about our, our products there. Uh, we have a book coming out in October called Your World Class Assistant. Uh, so if you just type in world cla- yourworldclassassistant.com, you'll find out more information about that book, um, but michaelhyatt.com is kind of the landing page for all things um, Michael Hyatt and company. Awesome, Jim. Well, thanks again, and we will talk soon. Enjoy Nashville. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Appreciate it, man. Thanks again to Jim for being on the show and sharing your story, and I'm really excited to be on episode 40, so check out the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash Four zero leaderassistant.com slash 40. Also, be sure to check out Michael Hyatt's book, Your World Class Assistant. Uh, I've got it. I've started uh, reading through it, and I think it's really helpful for uh, assistants to read, even though it's written to the executive. So thanks so much again for listening to the show. Episode 40 is now complete, and I will talk to you next time. Go Bullos.com.